It's not as, as, as pronounced as my colleague, Dr. Danilo, who's the co-director of nuclear medicine here with me, and he's from Padua, Italy, and anyone who's met him can testify to the fact that he's definitely still got his accent. <laughs> Every time he comes back, he comes back to, goes home to visit, he comes back here, and he's really hard to understand, but please just shout out if you can't hear me or if you don't understand what I'm saying. Um, my job as an imaging doctor is, is as part of the team. I'm not going to pretend to have all of the answers for how you manage this disease. I think that, as you've gathered from today, requires a lot of different people's input and uh, hopefully our team approach will make a difference to people's lives, but we're in it for the long game. Uh, my overview then is to talk about what is radioactive material and to give you a little bit of uh, science to understand the difference between all of these different uh, compounds that are used for imaging and for therapy. I'm going to speak about OctreoScan uh, versus NetSpot, uh, one being the Indium versus the PET Gallium 68 imaging. I'm going to talk about uh, PRT and just review a, a small amount of literature uh, for those who are interested in the science behind uh, how this PRT came about, how it works, and where it's going in the future. Uh, so that's complicated, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, there's lots of different radio tracers. They are metals, and they are um, a form of metal with some instability. And when we use the word decay in nuclear medicine, we're not talking about the rotten fruit in the fruit bowl. We're talking about the way in which the uh, unstable combination of uh, components of an atom uh, releasing energy to become more of a, a balanced, stable form of that uh, material. So the decay pathway uh, varies depending on what you're dealing with. Uh, Y90 and lutetium-177 are decaying by a beta decay. Uh, gallium-68 is a positron emission and the indium-111 or gallium-67 are decaying by a different pathway. Uh, there's no need to understand all of the, the detail about these different pathways. The point of this slide is to try to explain that these different decay pathways are what determine the way in which that heavy metal can be used in medicine for either imaging or treatment, because some of these energies emitted go a long way. Some of them have a medium energy, others have a high energy, and some of them go a very short way. Also, the time it takes for the unstable to become stable is highly variable depending on what you're dealing with. Some of the traces we use in nuclear medicine become, uh, go from unstable to stable and emit their energy and it's all done within seconds. And then there's other things like the lutetium that really takes a very long time. Now don't ask me the half-life because I can never remember them, I always just defer to Google, the medical textbook in the sky. Uh, so, gallium-68 PET-CT, well, what we had first in the 1980s uh, was the discovery that we could actually uh, use some imaging agent to show the distribution of the somatostatin receptors in the body, and the first tracer uh, that was available commercially was OctreoScan, which is the indium pentreotide targeting those receptors. The imaging was done with a gamma camera, and down the bottom there, those are poached images from the internet that are probably subject to copyright, so I'm sorry in advance. But one on the left is the GE uh, SPECT-CT, it's a gamma camera, and the one on the right there is what the PET-CT camera looks like. So the indium, we used a gamma camera to image using that uh, tracer. What's the point? Um, well, these cameras are, are very similar when you look at them. They've got a, a hardware that is taking the image and there's a table. And at some point, the equipment either rotates around you or the table moves through. 
Uh, most of the modern machinery now has both CT and the ability to detect the radioactive stuff. Now with NetSpot, um, there are advantages over the gamma camera imaging. There are advantages of increased sensitivity for detecting small things, a better spatial resolution, meaning I can see things that are tiny. Uh, we can measure what's called um, an SUV, which is uh, referred to as the silly uptake value in the nuclear medicine community, but is actually meant to be standardized uptake value. But it gives a numeric way of expressing how much tracer has gone to a site. And the PET-TT is actually a quicker way of getting the imaging done because it's a, it's a faster machine and uh, we don't have to wait a day or two or three to get good quality images like we did with the Octrea scan. So what are we imaging? We're imaging the somatostatin receptors. They have subtypes, I don't understand it, uh, but if it binds to a somatostatin receptor, I can see it. Uh, the radioactive particle is then linked to a peptide, a little protein, and the protein is targeting the receptor because this is uh, peptide receptor imaging. What does normal look like? Uh, the stuff that's given for the PET imaging of somatostatin receptors, the net spot using the gallium-68, it's given intravenously. As it circulates around the body, it is binding to sites of disease, but it's also going normally to organs uh, that have some expression of somatostatin receptors, which tends to be the uh, glandular organs, so the, the glands, the salivary glands, the pituitary gland up the top here, uh, the thyroid, and then uh, to some degree you see it in the liver, definitely in the spleen, and it's coming out through kidneys into the bladder. Seeing the bowel is minimal, uh, we don't tend to see the gallbladder, uh, but that's what a normal scan would look like. This is this is what an abnormal scan is going to look like in someone who has sites of metastatic neuroendocrine tumor that expresses somatostatin receptors. Uh, the tracer is bound so efficiently to those sites that they will show up more obviously than even background normal tissue most of the time. So it's, it's a little bit hair-raising when you first see your own scan, but if you've had one, I would encourage you to get a copy of the images and take a look so that you can see for yourself because uh, it really, it's, it's not rocket science to see these scans when they're obviously binding the tracer. Um, and I'd like to say you don't need to be a nuclear medicine doctor to do this, anyone can do it, but I, I don't think that's quite true. I think perhaps there's some nuance to the reporting and you do need to know your anatomy in three dimensions. Uh, but here you've got sites of, of tracer binding in the chest region, and this is a, what's called a MIP image, where you're not getting a sense of where things are in the depth of the image, so uh, these could be within nodes or within the lung. Uh, and then in the abdomen and pelvis sites and here in the groin, most of that's likely to be nodal. We did our first scan in uh, 2017. We have a total of 220 of these kinds of PET scans over 18 months, so it's not common. It's only 3.3% of our total PET volume, which if you do your math is an awful lot. There are two of us who read all of the PET scans. Uh, age range then has been between 19 and 94 years. Half the patients have been women, and uh, a third of the referrals from Dr. Hendafar's group. So there are other oncologists sending us patients for a wide variety of reasons to investigate symptoms of uncertain origin with perhaps tumor markers positive, or to stage for surgery, uh, to look after surgery for metastatic disease. And a wide range of different pathologies have been imaged using the tracer. We can use it as an imaging form to watch the stability of disease over time and to get a sense of how fast it's changing over time. Uh, because of being able to detect small things, we might give a report that reveals disease that's not been found by a CT or an MRI. Uh, but it may be that that's because I can see something with the tracer in it that's only three or four millimeters in size, which by CT would never be called abnormal. Otherwise, you'd call everything abnormal. So because you're targeting receptors, you might see more. Uh, and this imaging is crucial for establishing the eligibility for treatment, because treatment with PRT targets the same receptors. 
the example on the left then is a, is a slow interval, what I would call a slow interval progression, but there has been interval progression over a four-year time period where the sites that were abnormal in the liver are more numerous and there's now nodal disease in the chest and the abdomen. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have what I would call a partial response with, if you look just at the extent of the tracer in the liver at the site of disease, this has decreased over time. Uh, and the intensity of the tracer binding in lesions in the liver on the scan looks reduced over time. And this is a patient who had completed PRT and has some improvement in both the MR and the PET appearance. But what we see is highly variable, and uh, the snowflake there is in the middle for me to quote my 13-year-old boy, who's quite a delight. Uh, and he tells me that whenever I criticize anything about his, his personal behavior or the way in which he uh, sees the world, he says, but mum, we're all special snowflakes. And I am a special snowflake. Uh, so we are all different, and, and medicine needs to be personalized to take that into account. Uh, so having pathologic categories helps to understand what type of disease someone might have. Uh, having a genetic profile gives you much more color and meaning to that type. Uh, knowing what receptors are expressed by a tumor allows you to then target that tumor with your treatments. And the combination of this receptor-targeted imaging followed by a therapy with a receptor-targeted radioactive material, that's what we're calling theranostics. What a dreadful word, but it's a new word, and I'm sure it's going to make it into a dictionary, and some people spell it with a G, and I like it without a G. It just seems to look better to me, but that's supposedly the combination of uh, therapy and diagnostic imaging uh, that's been attached to this uh, entire field outside the bounds of neuroendocrine tumor. Scans can be positive whenever the somatostatin receptor is expressed, so it's not unique to gastrointestinal pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We can see the same sort of tracer uh, avidity in other metastatic disease. Also, the patterns of the way in which disease progresses is very different from person to person, and the speed at which that changes over time is very different, and the amount of symptom that a person may have with a particular burden of disease is very different from person to person. And I meet people who I think on the scan look like there's not that much going on and they're terribly debilitated by symptoms. And I meet other people who have scans that look more scary in terms of how many lesions there might be in the skeleton and they have minimal, no symptoms and no limitation whatsoever. So uh, don't let the scan put you off. Everybody's a different snowflake. Here's our team, um, radioactive receptor targeted radionuclide therapy, the PRRT with Lutathera is an outpatient procedure. Uh, we discuss patients behind their backs in the uh, multidisciplinary team meeting. And uh, Dr. Hentefeld is right, the parking is terrible, the coffee sucks, and, uh, and uh, but the point of that meeting is to put everybody in the same room who may or may be involved in the care, including people who have not yet been involved in the care, so that we have an opportunity to review the images in an environment where we can all see where we're at and hear about the story and make a decision about what the next best approach is. And we make that decision based on clinical experience, based on whatever literature is coming along to tell us when to do what, uh, and based on the individual patients in terms of how they're going to tolerate what you're suggesting. Uh, a patient coming for our treatment has to have a positive indium-111 octreotide scan or a positive gallium-68 PET within the preceding 12 months so that I'm sure that the tracer is, is going to go to the receptors. The insurance approval prior to scheduling treatment is to do with our workflow considerations. We had one patient who I met in consultation and it wasn't until three months later that we finally got through the insurance approval process, by which point anything that we'd discussed had been forgotten 
uh, and really it, it, it made everything somewhat confused and uh, disadvantageous. So what we've decided is that I will see people in consultation once insurance has been approved, but we will make a decision as a team to identify people who are eligible. What's the purpose then of visiting me if you can just decide on paper? Uh, well, I, it's not just me. I'm just one little part of the puzzle for delivering the treatment. Our nursing staff like to meet patients beforehand and our radiation staff, uh, radiation safety staff spend quite a lot of time discussing radiation safety considerations and ensuring that the home environment is not going to expose anybody who might be harmed by the treatment at home. We give four doses, eight week intervals. Each dose is, a, is an infusion over 30 minutes, but the actual procedure visit time is more like five hours because of the need to place two IV lines and run the amino acid infusion through one and give the infusion through the other. The amino acid infusion is protecting the kidneys from the initial wave of radioactive material that's circulating because you saw on the first scan it comes out through the kidneys. Um, now that we have a two amino acid infusion uh, available here, and uh, I'm sad to say we were probably the last in LA to get it approved, but well, now that we're using it, the need for nausea, anti-nausea medications almost gone to zero. Uh, it's very well tolerated. Oh, I forgot to mention, and uh, Giovanna wanted me to mention this, the Trojan horse analogy. It's sneaky, isn't it? You give it, it circulates, it's targeting the receptors, but the tracer with the radioactive material is actually being incorporated into the cells before it's then delivering its energy over time in the, in the tumor. And it's therefore damaging very little of bystander normal tissue. It's damaging where you want it to damage the tissue that has tumor in it. Uh, how do we know it works is a question. Uh, this was uh, some of the uh, tables and graphs representing differences in uh, change over time. On the top left is the progression-free survival in patients receiving PRRT with octreotide long-acting somatostatin receptor versus the control group who were not getting the PRRT. They were just having the octreotide injections. So the progression-free survival curve really separates very dramatically in this clinical trial that looked at uh, 116 patients having treatment compared to 113 patients having standard of care with the long-acting octreotide. Uh, that was the NETA-1 trial, and CEDARS was one of the sites, and um, Dr. Wallen and Dr. Hendafar were very involved with that, and it was happening right when I joined the hospital, so I have seen some people through that trial. Now we're happy to have it available commercially. Uh, this was the other major paper from uh, 2017, the same year, that was a European report on uh, the experience of, of uh, overall survival and uh, progression-free survival being improved by the use of this kind of disease. Uh, so the progression-free survival uh, is similar regardless of whether you're doing your clinical trial in the United States or in Europe. Uh, and that's always good in medicine to have someone do the same kind of clinical follow-up and see the same result. It gives you more confidence that what we're seeing in that literature is the truth. So who should be referred? Uh, the insert in the package says that we're indicated for the treatment of somatostatin receptor positive, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, including foregut, midgut, hindgut in adults. Uh, that's a lot of words. Uh, if I were a, a nit picking insurer trying to decline somebody's pre-authorization, I might say that this indication does not include um, a, a primary of uh, something that's not in the gut or the pancreas. I might even challenge whether or not the lung can be considered the foregut. I don't think it is technically. Uh, so that always worried me seeing that come out here was whether or not we would have pushback about disease that was not technically a gastroenteropancreatic primary. But the reality seems to be that anyone with the net spot positive 
tumour referred for treatment has managed to be uh, approved from multiple different insurers and from Medicare we've not seen any pushback for something that's not uh, gastrointestinal pancreatic primary. Our cautions then are to look at the rest of the body just to be sure that the kidneys are in good shape, the bone marrow is in good shape and that the overall liver function test has, uh, has an indication that your liver is in good enough shape to have the treatment without uh, damaging those organs. I'm not going to give this kind of radioactive treatment to somebody who's also having some other liver targeted treatment at the same time or receiving chemo at the same time. I don't think we know that that's a safe thing to do and there's certainly no scientific data to say that those things should be combined at the same time for any advantage. My concern with chemotherapy would be that you're going to give a double whack insult to the bone marrow by giving you a PRT that can lower platelet count and hemoglobin uh, and white count at the same time as a chemotherapy that might be doing the same, then you could get into trouble with side effects. The only actual contraindication to this treatment uh, really is, is to do with someone's ability to comply with radiation safety requirements or someone who has uh, a scan that's not positive or has no uptake, in which case our treatment's just going to go out into the toilet and do no good. Uh, because the duration of the treatment for one course of therapy is four treatments at two month intervals, that's eight months and then by the time you're getting pre-authorized, we're talking about a year's commitment to come to this treatment if your life expectancy is less than three months is, is not the appropriate time to be considering something like this. It needs to be considered at a time where you can get some long-term benefit from this kind of investment uh, of a year's worth of treatment. So I get lots of questions. Um, how's it going to make me feel? That's highly variable and uh, my small experience uh, tells me that people who are uh, limited in their functional capacity coming into treatment may well tolerate it very poorly and people who have virtually no limitation are really highly functional uh, are likely to do extremely well with minimal side effects. Uh, the typical feedback I get is that uh, people feel like they're a bit off colour, uh, slight loss of appetite, a little bit like having the flu and occasionally going to bed to rest for a day or two. And uh, I have had patients tell me that they felt so great they went surfing the next day. And I've had a lot of people tell me that their symptoms felt better uh, incrementally starting with the first visit and then incrementally better after each of the treatments were given. Uh, what are the risks? Well, uh, we have a risk of insulting normal body organs, so we need to make sure that, uh, that the rest of your function is good. Uh, there is a risk of inducing or having an incidence of a leukemia, acute or chronic type leukemia develop as a result of radiation exposure, and the uh, percentage of people in the clinical trials with that kind of adverse event is under 2%. Uh, the other risks then, uh, it does not make you glow in the dark, no one's going to turn into the Incredible Hulk, uh, no one's going to know that you've had it by looking at you, you can't see the radiation, it's not like chemotherapy, it won't make you sick for days, typically it doesn't, uh, and it certainly does not trigger hair loss or anything dramatic. So generally, although it's got that radioactive word that's sort of fairly freaky, it's generally very well tolerated with not very much in the way of side effects. Yes, we have treated other primaries other than gastroenteritis and pancreatic, a lot of different types of disease with the same receptor expression. Uh, should you have PRT or should you have liver targeted treatment, that's a decision for your team. <clears throat> and uh, generally speaking, if the disease is limited to one organ and can be either cut out or treated effectively locally, then that seems like a sensible thing to do. Uh, but the real answer to the question about where PRT has its place in the time course of treatment uh, is not resolved uh, and is, is still a subject of debate and ongoing observation. 
the question I'm asked a lot is, should you have this treatment first before you have chemotherapy, for instance? And I think the answer is we're not really quite sure about that. Uh, treatment decisions are made on a patient basis, depending on what the person's likely to tolerate. And generally, if you have an excellent response to something that you can take by mouth, then uh, that would be preferable to stick with that until there's some reason to desire to change the course of treatment. But as I said at the beginning, I'm not the person making that decision solo. I can't pretend to know enough about uh, the neuroendocrine malignancies as an imaging doctor. So I sit in a room and we talk about these things as a, as a team. We don't restage patients during the course of the treatment. We wait until uh, the four treatments have been given before we restage. I think in Europe there's a little bit more of the imaging going on. Uh, some of the limitation we have here is for bureaucratic reasons of when it is that your next scan is going to be authorized and approved by insurance. Uh, but from a pragmatic point of view, if I've decided that yes, we're going to go ahead with four treatments, then my plan is to deliver those four therapies over the course of eight months. And as long as the patient's feeling well, and there are no clinical features to suggest something major has shifted, we're going to assume that it's doing some good and then take a look at the end. Uh, because I think to myself, well, if we took a look at the net spot halfway through the, the four treatments and it was not much different, would I stop? And I don't think I would because the clinical trial data suggested that we're going to give this as four treatments. Uh, so if the imaging is not going to change management, don't do it. We're going to wait until the end. And should that imaging be with MRI or gallium 68 PET? Generally, uh, when you're restaging disease and looking for disease activity, it's going to be with the same imaging modality at baseline and then follow up because you want to compare apples and apples. Uh, it's hard for me to see a PET scan in someone who's had treatment and has no prior PET scan to compare to, to say whether or not what I'm seeing is improvement or worsened disease. It's a little bit easier if you're comparing apples and apples. And can it be given again and again and again? Um, I think the answer is going to be yes, but the number of uh, published reports are small and the number of patients who are in this bracket of having had repeated courses of radioactive material over time is relatively small. It's less than 400 in these two papers combined. What was interesting, though, from what has come out so far is that the incidence of leukemia was still low and nobody had severe renal toxicity and in a selected group of people who uh, could tolerate more treatment there seemed to be a survival benefit and uh, a continued response or repeated response to this kind of treatment approach, and that's positive for us to know. Here's the update just briefly to finish off for what we're doing here at Cedars. Uh, obviously, there are a number of sites around the country. Uh, I have had limited opportunity to talk to other sites about how they do things. Uh, we set things up to try and make it a, a team approach and uh, setting up our program took a long time because of how many people are involved, the need to have a dedicated facility, uh, the need to access the amino acid and uh, access the substance and give it safely. So we did our first consultation in April of 2018 and treated our first patient here in May. Uh, the two amino acid infusion we didn't get access to until March of this year and to date we have seven patients who've completed all four treatment visits and we've given 61 infusions. Uh, looking towards the future here, uh, we now have a third nuclear medicine physician privileged to supervise this kind of radioactive material administration and that helps with workflow for sure. We now have three of our technologists trained to administer the treatment and there will be more technologists trained. Our visit time has decreased. Uh, we're talking about having people come uh, with two patients on the same day uh, with the need to carefully match people so that we don't have uh, a, a man and a woman. It would probably be that it needs to be two women or two men, but people who are able to 
be in the same room. Because we have two bed bays, that means we can increase our efficiency and reduce wait times for people. And in the pipeline, our radio pharmacy is going to have a major renovation, and that will allow us to have a facility that can do some sterile compounding and uh, potentially have an on-site gallium-68 generator, which changes the whole ballpark for nuclear medicine here. Uh, it's likely that there will be another camera put in, and we have a lot of different therapies that are targeting different cancers. So this uh, treatment facility is going to be busy, would be the prediction. This is our team, team meeting. There's Dr. Hendifer. Uh, and uh, this is Mr. Crabb, and he did uh, give us a, a release for use of his image, and uh, his, so I'm not breaching any HIPAA rules here by saying this is Mr. Crabb, but he is extremely happy. His wife was extremely happy with the treatment received. I did hear from her that the uh, number of times she had to clean the bathroom went down dramatically, and she thought that just from the point of view of symptom relief, it was great. Uh, so thank you very much. It does take a village. Uh, I'm really proud to be uh, part of this team within our nuclear medicine department. I hope that uh, some of you had an opportunity to meet Paige, who's here, one of our technologists, but there are a lot of people involved. And uh, you'll, if you come here, you will get to know these people. We get to know each other over the course of months of treatment. So thanks. <laughs>